This is a good sound uh, scene. It was quite difficult. We had ended up going out and recording cars from another car's perspective and doing all these motor buys and, and the siren blips and so forth. So now I want to put more detail in it now that I'm hearing without anything. So oftentimes, you know, a lot of things prepared. Like this scene, we probably, if we went back to the um, original effect stems, it probably was a little bit, a little bit heavier, a little bit more masculine. But we ended up toning it down so that we were, when we arrived, it would be more aggressive. So sometimes, in order for some scene or noise to have a lot of impact, it has to have a lot of silence before it. If you have a lot of noise before, there's no impact to the new sound that's incoming. It's just as loud as the other sound. So that's a very important thing, is the sense of dynamics and space. The music is so important there, and I think you don't really notice it. Once we get inside, it's, as an audience, you're so curious about what's going to happen next that your ears shut down in a way, and, and you're, you're, you're just, just simply watching what's happening, and you really don't notice. It's a visual thing. It's all coming in. All that light is coming in through your eyes. And it's a very visual thing, and you want to look at it, and you want that light to kind of penetrate into your brain, and you want to interpret that somehow, and that movement, and the way things look, and the colors, and the way things are shaped, and the way people speak. And of course, the sounds they make are important. But at an early stage in a film where you're just hearing the dialogue, the look and the feel of it are much more compositional in a way. You can read a script and you can intellectually feel something from it, from the dialogue and what they're saying, what the story is about and how it's being expressed and how the characters are interacting and how the film moves. You can, you know, but I think until you see it in a projection, do you then feel something? You want to start to write music to it. Because music is, music is a very abstract thing film, you know, Sprock, you know, c c celluloid going through that projector with that light shining, you know, that light just shining on a screen. That's a little abstract, too, if you think about it, right? That's a little dream, dreamlike. And so you want to get into that dream, and you want to sort of stay in there and, and kind of wake up occasionally and write down some notes. So, you know, when I do uh, classes, university, they everybody wants to know like how you compose you know how, and you can't it's very difficult to really explain the process and they say well what's the first thing you do when you start I say usually it involves some napping and I, and they laugh <laughs> what you're doing but it's tr you know the the feeling is is that you want to go you want to be in a very subconscious state you want to dream about the film and express something musically without any kind of interference to it or you want to get like a sort of a direct relationship with what's on screen and what you feel about it that's a very dream dreamlike kind of period and then there'll be a lot of time after that to have interaction and discussion and other ideas and <laughs> this you know but i mean you got to have that first very sort of private thing where you're expressing it on your own. What do you feel about it? You have to believe that you could close your eyes, think of the music, wake up, and write it down. All the dialogue is, is looped 100%. There's a real big problem with rain noise in, in the original production recording. Um, no fault of Willie's. It was just a very difficult place to record. And so it, it ended up being um, all re-recorded, all the dialogue. And I think they did a really great job. There's one really nice sound 
where Gwyneth puts her hand down and you hear her ring hit the, the cup. And that was one of those things that actually happened in the production. And um, when, of course, um, we re-recorded all the dialogue, that sound was missing and, and you really felt it missing. And it's amazing how just a little sound like that says, you know, she's married and she loves her husband. It, all these little things, that you, you don't think it really matters, but just that little sound is so, it's so precious. And uh, those little things, David, you know, David was like, oh, God, I have that ring. You know, and I remember all this focus, like the cup and getting the cup and then the Margie, our Foley artist, like, how does this sound? Plink. Do you have a different ring? How about, do you have anything more, you know? So it, there's a lot of little crazy little details that, you know, you don't think about, but that people are actually thinking about that little noise. A lot of those sounds are actually recorded in mono, like the sound of the, you hear a clunking sound, that's the sound of a cappuccino uh, handle being banged and all the coffee grinds being banged out and that was a mono signal and little cups and saucers being put down and the motorbike going by and all the back you know the trucks and things and you can record that sound in stereo and it's all across the front of the screen it's a very wide image but sometimes it's actually more fun to record it in mono and it's a and then you put it just over to the left and then you put it an opposing sound over to the right and if you were to really listen to it technically it's not right I mean, it's not correct. It's not a correct image because you know the sound wouldn't be purely on the left or purely on the right. But if you layer enough of these things together, then the image becomes very dense, and you can have these really neat textures between the clunking of the, um, the cappuccino and the bing bing bing, the ringing of the bell, uh, you know, the the order up, you know, that sound, um, and those are those types of things are actually fun to play with, where you kind of change you're taking the mono idea and then then utilizing stereo in a, in a very simple way and uh, simple approach and ultimately you know it should be able to collapse down to mono and still work in terms of perspective i've always been taught that it's it's always important to record the sound that's attached to the, a particular scene at the appropriate distance by which the camera is framed from that object. When the phone is ringing, you, it might be happening in another room. You have to establish where that room is, and then its distance is always a constant, but our distance where we are jumping from camera shot to camera shot is getting either farther or closer or to the left or to the right. And so there's two basic things that are occurring. One is the actual distance by which the microphone is placed to the prop, in this case a phone, and the perspective of where our hero is, Mills, and where the phone is moving and finding it and hearing it the way that he's hearing it. Uh, and then secondly is the position of it in the speakers. In the theater now we have all these speakers. It used to be that we just had one speaker in the center and a mono speaker, but now we have the luxury of having all these speakers all around us. And so we can now place the sound of the phone in this direction by which Mills is looking. So if he's looking over there to the left, we can place the phone over there to the left with that recording of it being 40 feet away. So it's a lot of fun putting it all together. And the other fun thing is just the rhythm of the phone is very difficult because it might be ringing, but then they'll cut. So you have to, it's, it's, if you listen carefully, the timing of the phone is cheated. If you were to take a measuring device and measure each phone ringing, you would probably realize that each one is not properly spaced but the human ear is pretty forgiving, and if you have a, a ring and a space, and it's you could you could come in four or five, six frames off from the other ring, and it would still be okay. So there's a lot of cheating going on, and that's when you have a good relationship with the picture editor. You can sometimes beg for him to or her to please add on another six frames of the tail that shot. <laughs> so you know, you get into negotiating with the picture editor sometimes if you can't get a sound to fit in. Here's a good example of World Eyes music. Um, Steve Boderker and I, my um, assistant at the time, wrote that music cue. It was this very throb, in fact, we called it throb, uh, throbbing piece, and, and Steve played guitar, and, and we had a lot of big 
drums playing through it, um, big 808 kick drum, which you often hear driving down the road. It makes that, <laughs> that pulsating heartbeat type sound. And we played it in the scene. And again, it just, it sounded fake. It sounded kind of canned. And so we ended up going over to um, a friend of ours, Pete Scaturro's. He has this wonderful house. It's sort of a recording studio slash house, and Pete's a music producer. And uh, he's got this giant, it's sort of like a warehouse. And we set up speakers, and we the sound that we wanted to get was the sound of a nightclub. You know when you're outside of a nightclub and you hear the bass rumbling through the wall, and as you go in, you hear it through a wall, and you get closer and closer and all of a sudden there's something that's very bright and sibilant that comes out and kind of zings you in the air and that sort of thing. And so we ended up setting up these giant speakers that he had for some um, band that he was working with at the time and blasted it, put the speakers on 11 and set up microphones and then re-recorded the music from all sorts of different perspectives. And then we laid all these different, we resynchronized all these music tracks together and brought them to the to the uh, mix stage and then we mixed the different elements in so that when Somerset's coming down the stairs it's a little bassy and then when they turn the corner we got, went to a different perspective recording and then we went to a different perspective recording and then finally when they go in the room it's even brighter and that sort of thing and if you listen really closely you can hear um, these sort of if you listen to the track right before Brad says get him out of here now get him out of here now you hear these sort of sibilant sounds, and those are actually recordings of porno orgasm sexual sounds that were sort of timed into the music. But because they're recorded in the space of a room, they have this strange sort of zingy quality to them. I went to music school at um, UCSC and my teachers, I was studying um, electronic music at the time. And my professor, Gordon Muma, showed the class this piece uh, by this composer named Alvin Lussier. And that was the inspiration to a lot of this, the technique. Um, Alvin Lussier wrote this piece of music called I'm Sitting in a Room. It's a poem, but it's almost a description of what it is that he's doing. And he says, I'm sitting in a room most likely similar to the one that you're in right now. I'm recording my voice onto a micro, into a microphone and recording it onto a track. And then I will later play that recording back into the room and re-record it to another track. I will continue to do that until the sibilances and, and the formant structures of my voice resonate throughout the room and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He describes the recording process. And then as you listen to this recording, it starts to sound zingy and ringy and buzzy. But by the ending, if you listen to like the... I don't know how many passes he did, but I think around the 12th pass or the 14th pass, it's just, it sounds like nothing. I mean, it sounds like harmonics and strange wails. I mean, it takes on a completely different character. And so that was sort of the inspiration for me was Alvin Lussier's recording technique and that sort of the oppressive re-recording of something again and again and that sort of copy of a copy sound. It was sort of the inspiration behind doing these crazy re-recordings. <laughs> 